you've been talking about the need for Bitcoin, and so it, that's the demand side. Uh, what are the plans to make the supply of Bitcoin grow until it uh, satisfies those 80% of people who are bankless? Because um, you know, 10 billion in value is less than 1% of 1% of the need I'm talking only about physical needs. Right. So Bitcoin's monetary policy is very specific. It's designed to simulate precious metals. So it's a system of restricted supply without fractional reserve. Right. It's a fully backed currency where you have 20 million, 21 million coins is the maximum that will ever be created. Now, if you hear that, you say 21 million coins, how can you possibly fit a world economy in that? The point is, Bitcoin is not a traditional currency. It's a programmable currency. And that 21 million is subdivided by eight decimal points, which means that you have 100 million smaller units in every Bitcoin. So one Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshi, which is the smallest unit you can have. We can divide it even further than that. So you can cut it into smaller and smaller pieces. So if you talk about it in terms of 21 quadrillion monetary units, 21 quadrillion monetary units could fit the world economy as it is today, right? Um, with a with a value of a tenth of a dollar approximately per unit for 21 quadrillion. That would give you 210. Uh, trillion dollars, or do the math. But if you just decide to cut it up, it would create some form of other inflation in reverse. Well, in reverse, exactly. So if you cut it up, what happens is that you have a deflationary effect. So you have a relatively fixed supply with increasing demand. What that does is it drives the price of the currency up, and. So deflation is a very scary thing, especially if you're an economist. And the reason deflation is a scary thing is because in, in classical economics, we now deal with currencies that are fractional reserve. Right? So what are the conditions under which you have deflation in a fractional reserve currency? So you have a government that has the ability to create infinite supply. What does it take for the demand to so far collapse below the supply, that even infinite supply creates deflation? And the answer is simple. You have to have a catastrophic collapse in demand. Not just a recession, a full-blown depression. So whenever you see in systems of money where you can create, you can just keep printing money, right? Inflation is a problem. Deflation is not a problem, right? Because if you can keep printing money, someone's going to spend it. That's not the problem. Why would no one spend it? Because the economy has collapsed completely. So the only places in the world where we see deflation as a monetary phenomenon are places where you have a catastrophic collapse in, in demand. Japan is a great example of that now in its 20th year of deflation. And we've seen it in a few other countries which where just before they go into the hyperinflation, they first dip into a deflationary period. Everybody keeps their money under their mattress. Then they have a slight increase in the positive sentiment. The money comes out into the market again, and then you go Weimar Republic, <laughs> hundred billion trillion marks for a cup of coffee, <laughs> right? Um, so deflation is bad if deflation is a monetary phenomenon where you have infinite supply, but it's not necessarily bad if the supply is restricted. Let me give you an example of deflation we all like. How many people here have a phone? that costs the same as the phone they bought ten years ago. How many here have a phone that's less expensive for the same capabilities as the phone they bought ten years ago? We all do, right? So you get ten times more processing power, ten times more memory than two years ago. Yes? My first cell phone was slightly bigger than this microphone. Um, it had 18 minutes of talk time, 18 minutes before the battery would run out, and I paid almost 1,000 pounds sterling to buy it. And today, this thing runs for 20 some hours, has more processing than the first supercomputers, actually more processing than a thousand of the first supercomputers, 
and it cost me about six hundred dollars. And guess what that's called? Deflation. That's deflation in action. That's where my money buys more product, has more value in a market where you have deflation. Deflation is great. With laptops, we love it. With falling prices for uh, products, we love it. For um, businesses that are efficient, we love it. When deflation is caused not by a collapse in demand, but by improvements in efficiency and constrained supply, we love it. So deflation is not really necessarily a problem. But on the other hand, we don't know. Uh, one of the things we see in uh, cryptocurrencies is there's a lot of competition for the monetary model. If you don't like Bitcoin's monetary model, you can find others that have different models with higher levels of inflation. The monetary policy is a very interesting characteristic to me because in a world where every other currency is printed to infinity, this is the only one that isn't. So that's a good thing. Um, at least it's a different thing, so it's counter-correlated. Um, and to an investor, that's a very interesting thing to have something that is counter-correlated. I can always get inflation-based currencies. Um, when you see things like Brexit happen, or you see um, collapses in the yuan or sudden devaluations in the yuan, three things go up: yen, because it's deflating, <laughs> right? Gold, and Bitcoin. Fancy that. That's a weird situation going on in monetary politics, because everything else is moving in the same direction. And the only three things that are moving in the opposite direction are Japanese yen, gold, and Bitcoin. So I'm not an economist. Again, I'll disclaim that, and hope I covered a bit of that.